So there's always a few people who want to know what does the what does the actual original system on chip FPA look like? What is the original chip design? And so I wanted to like give you give a short view, a sort of overview in detail. I'm assuming you've actually seen FPAs and thought about this a little bit. This is of course the the die photo of it, where you can actually see there's a fabric and microprocessor and so forth. You can also this is also one of the development boards for it. But if you look at the chip, and I'll often you know draw it out as this kind of structure, it has this whole whole sort of fabric of digital and analog components. The original three, the original chip actually had um, 14 by 14 total components, seven of which were digital, some of which were analog. They're interspersed because you can actually run analog and digital on the same fabric. And this was really important because if you think about even doing some, doing a lot of different analog components, you often want some digital control structure around it. If you're thinking like, well, I want to I want to compile an ADC. So an analog to digital converter, I need to have some digital and some analog around it. So I actually need things together. And the minute you get away from the view of all of the analog is in one place and all the digital has to be somewhere else and there's some interesting interfacing and the two shall never meet, once you get away from that, it changes how you start to do design, how you start to think about all these pieces. So the core of it is a number of digital analog components. The, the digital components are basically ACLBs. They all have um, SRAM blocks in them, <coughs> well, actually register blocks in them, and uh, basically have a routing infrastructure going into it. The analog components are a number of things, it's just a partial list of them, uh, that includes um, transconductance amplifiers, transistors, capacitor switches. There's a few other things in there, including a couple current mirrors. Um, there's also some floating gate uh, transistors directly, and, and, a, and a couple other components in there. Uh, that actually allow you to have connectivity to this. Now, of course, you still have the full routing fabric as on both sides of that. This is all done in a Manhattan geometry. Uh, remember, again, now you're talking about having C blocks and S blocks, uh, as well as the CABs and CLBs interdigitated there. We usually have all the CLBs in one column, all the CABs in one column, so we tend to modularize it in that form tends to make our design tools happier. There's nothing particularly sacred about doing it, though. Um, and so the C blocks basically look like routing, and it basically just gives you these floating gate crossbars. And remember that the floating gate crossbars give you perfectly good, really good switches. In fact, single floating gates are great for this, because although a normal PFET would pass a, a high value well, but not a low value, as you can see in this in the structure, this power supply for this chip was about two and a half volts. If I do this as a floating gate element, I can pass low values and high values with reasonably similar conductance level. It does change a little bit, but it's reasonably similar. And the reason that happens is that because of the charge on the floating gate stays there, it also means it doesn't have to stay within the power supply rail. So it means I can program this to a voltage that is well below ground. As a result, a single PFET can pass low and high values. So that's kind of different from how many people would think about uh, what's actually sort of, you know, what's normally happening in typical logic, which would, so most people think, I must have a transmission gate to make this work. And in this case, no, I don't. What that allows me to do is not just pass, you know, ones or zeros effectively, but it actually allows me to also have the analog values and fully use this crossbar for analog computing. And so it means that all of this routing that might look like dead weight in here is now useful for computing. The last part is then also we have the switch blocks, which allows you to move between the tracks. And that has both allows you both analog and digital components. There are buffers and routing in there. But otherwise, it's fairly straightforward. So this is kind of the initial perspective on what's in this chip. Obviously, one would want to get in great detail if you're going to really start to uh, really work with some of the detailed circuit elements, but this is sufficient enough to do complete level circuit design using these devices uh, and using all the elements in the cabs. Uh, if you wanted to do more complex questions, you would ask, you know, you might have to ask, okay, well, how do I control all some of these components here for some of the programming infrastructure? Um, what would I need in terms of the processor? There's some additional components in there. Um, the processor is a very straightforward processor. It's an MSB uh, MSP430 open open source structure works really well. Uh, it's 
And again, if you're dealing with a system where the computing is heavily analog, um, having a, a very good integer processor makes a tremendous amount of sense in these architectures. So this gives you an overview of this. There's a huge amount more you could go into in every single part, uh, but hopefully this gives you an idea of what's actually sitting in this particular chip, a chip that is basically this was the starting point for all of these sort of configurable architectures going forward.